Anybody ever get stressed out over the busyness this season? You know what we did yesterday? If you can believe this. We had to run to Edmonton. We went to a mall. I had to tell you a mall on a Saturday in December. There are less stressful ways to spend a Saturday. Now, I don't know if this was a divine thing or not, but we started driving around the mall truck with a thousand other people trying to find a spot, and Zoe suddenly yelled at me to break. <laughs> it's because somebody was pulling out right beside handicap parking, and we got the best spot in the whole mall. But, I'm going to tell you the rest of the experience was not quite as stress-free. It's kind of the way that it goes this time of year, isn't it? We live lives that tend to be very stressful and busy, regardless of whether it's December or not, right? And there's a lot of things that happen in life, and as we're going through it, we tend to forget something. And we tend to forget who Jesus is and what he's done in our lives, because stress makes us focused on ourselves. There's a lot that we need to learn about just stopping in our lives and staring at our Savior. We need the great hope of Jesus, don't we? Yeah. And he's a remarkable one. It's a story, a horse and his boy, part of the C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, that talks about this lion who's been doing everything in a young boy named Shasta's life behind the scenes. Even where he doesn't realize, even where he thinks things are going horribly wrong, there the great lion is, working behind the scenes until finally he comes forward towards the end of the book. And they're walking along, and Chess is a little nervous because he's got this fearsome one beside him. And he asks him who he is. And the reply is this. It's a one-word reply. The answer to who he is, is myself. It is echoing the cry that Moses is given when he asked God who he is, and he says, I am now who I am. Huh? That is all we can say about Jesus, that he is unique, and there is no one like our God. And in a world that is trapped in the false, in a world that loves to be so negative, we find Jesus. One in whom there is no self-deception, no acting contrary to his basic nature. And we're going to take a few moments this morning to talk about a Savior who comes that we might know truth. This is finishing off a, a, a short sermon series that we've had called God with us. We've been talking about what does it mean, what does it look like that Jesus came to our world? What characteristics do we find in Jesus that when we look at him, he changes who we are so much that we become like him. So we've talked about a few things. We've talked about some of these spiritual traits. we talked about the fact that he came in joy. We haven't took it so far as saying in happiness, although happiness is a fleeting thing. Joy is something permanent, but he came in laughter. He came to bring us something deep there. Jesus came in humility. He laid aside the glory and the power of being God. He came in generosity. <coughs> and it's, we've gone through these things gone through joy, generosity, hope. We've seen in each of these ways in which Jesus came to be with us, in which Jesus came to teach us. In each of these ways, it changes us because we become more like him. Truth sounds different, though. Truth sounds like not a characteristic that we should have, but something that we should learn. Something we should maybe take time to go study or something like that. But you know, in Christianity, Christianity, truth is not facts that we figure out. Truth 
is a character trait of God himself. And he's bringing it into our lives. Truth is reflected in God himself. We read earlier from 1 Timothy where it says this, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Let's face it back here. The first part I'm just putting in so we get the full sentence. But then he says, I want you to know how you should behave. That's to do with truth, right? To behave yourself sometimes have to do with our morals, our ethics, the way we see right and wrong. Absolutely. You may know how you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. It's not just this building, it's the people that we are. A pillar and buttress of truth. Truth, we find there. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. I find this little bit remarkable. Okay, you want to know how to be good? You want to, you want to know how to live in truth? You, you want the secret to this? I'll give you the mystery. I'll give you the secret of godliness here and there. And do you know what's going to happen right away? Is Paul breaks out in song. He starts to sing. He sings his answer to this. At least it comes across the way it's written, as lyrical, as musical. And here's what he does. Here's the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh. Vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. What is this mystery? Of living right. What is the mystery of godliness? And he breaks out in song singing about Jesus. See, we might expect he's going to answer by saying, oh, okay, well, do A, B, C, D. And everybody's going to be happy. He doesn't. He breaks out in song about Jesus. You want to know all you need to know about what's right and wrong? And he sings about Jesus. He breaks out in song about Jesus. That is the true mystery of godliness. And we struggle that. Romans chapter 9 says this, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Paul here is writing, talking about folks who might be religious. Might be trying to follow God by doing what's right and proving their godliness by their actions. And Paul writes here, do you know what? You're going to stumble over Jesus. If you're just trying to be truth, you're going to struggle here. Because these religious folks, and that can be us very easily, make truth about themselves, make right and wrong about what we're comfortable with. Truth. It's an interesting phrase. We generally know when I'm only talking about something's true, what do we think about? We think about it's it's factual. It's accurate. Um, it's an idea that might have an ethical nature to it. It might be right things to do. But whatever it is, it has to be true. You know, there's a Greek word here. You want to learn? Do you know? learn one word of Greek today. I'll teach you one. Okay, I got one, yes. Aletheia. It's a Greek word. It means truth. It gets translated truth here. But it's interesting that its meaning is slightly different than the English word truth. We don't have a perfect word to describe this. We just don't. It's, it, there's nothing that quite hits it. it. It does encompass this idea of being factual. It encompasses this idea of being right, but it's a bigger word than that. And maybe the best way we can understand what this word means is not so much looking at its definition, but what its opposite is. Opposite of truth in English, we would say it's probably lie, <coughs> falsehood, something like that. That is not exactly the opposite of the word that, that Paul's using in, in, in several of these phrases, this aletheia. 
The opposite is hypocrite. Hypocrisy. It's an interesting concept. Because hypocrisy is about lying to ourselves and the world around us. It's about trying to put on a false front. It is trying to be somebody I'm not. So back in, 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 in Timothy, Paul says, okay, you want to know the secret of godliness? You want to know how to live properly? Well, here's Jesus. He doesn't give a list of what to do because you know what? None of us does that list perfectly. None of us does it right. See, we, we, we like a set of rules because it's easier. Oh, particularly in this day and age, we live in a highly divided world, don't we? Man, if you say the wrong things to a certain group of people, oh man, you're in trouble, right? Man, that's Don Cherry. <laughs> you say the wrong thing at the wrong time, you are in major trouble. That's the world we live in, and we set these rules, these boundaries up, and that becomes right. Our problem is, all of us at some point are going to cross a boundary somewhere, aren't we? And so we demand that other people live within our boundaries, even though, you know, we don't necessarily pull it off ourselves, and we often are living outside even of our own boundaries. So truth is something bigger than just how we might envision it. It's something deeper. And God has so much more for us in it. Jesus being truth, as part of his characteristics, rather than just knowing facts, matters deeply. Well, why does it matter? I know this is, might, the first little bit of this might get a little confusing because we're kind of getting to, to philosophy and stuff, but you know what? It boils down this. Life isn't just an easy set of rules that I set up. I am right, you are wrong. God did not send Jesus to teach us facts. That is not to say we can't learn things from him, that we can't learn facts from him, but that is not his purpose. His purpose was not to educate. Way back in the Old Testament, there was a guy by the name of Moses. You may have heard of him. He was sent by God to teach us. He was sent by God to give us facts. But everybody still messed up. Everybody knew this is what's right, this is what's wrong, this is how it works, and they still messed up. Do you know what? We don't need a teacher. We need a savior. We need one who will come and take away the wrong in our lives and replace it with his goodness, who will change the way that we are. And Jesus comes, and he is truth. What about over here, this little tapestry type, I don't know what you call it. It's a quote from Jesus in John 14. We have it up on the front of our church for a reason. I am the way, truth. The life. Jesus doesn't come to teach us truth. He comes to introduce us to himself because he is truth. Really, when we get to the Bible's definition of what is truth, that word alethe, really, you can replace it with one word, and it's Jesus. Jesus is truth. I read this week, I'll quote a couple of times today by a man by the name John Eldridge, who says this, Jesus is simply himself. Playful, cunning, generous, fierce. No one moment of it is contrived. He never plays to the audience. He never, he uses a funny word here that some may know, kowtows to the opposition, and that means bows down. In other words, never just accept, you know, here something's wrong, he never just accepts it. He never takes his cues from the circus around him. He is simply being himself. 
We need to move deeper in our relationship with Jesus than just knowing about him, than just having facts about him, than being able to answer quiz about him. Christianity is a movement from what is false to what is true. A self that we may not want anybody else to know about. Jesus comes and in love he confronts our failures, our sins, our struggles, and in he confronts it. It is to help us discover a God who loves us. And God's goal in our life is not that we can go around and put on a good show and pretend that we're holier than somebody else. God doesn't want us to look good because you know what? We're all going to fail along the lines. We're not to pretend. We're to find authenticity in Jesus. And that does not happen unless we truly get to know. It's not at a surface. It's allowing him to work at our deepest life. To abandon our need to be right. Our needs to succeed at life. Even our needs to appear right in our faith. Because Jesus needs to confront the problems at the deepest part of our souls. There's an irony in truth that we need to be able to be wrong to truly allow him to confront us. We need to understand a little bit the opposite of truth, maybe. You know, in Titus, Titus chapter 1, book in the New Testament, um, there's a little bit of a, a play on words in it, in which Paul says the people of this island that, that Titus is living on, Crete, uh, he says the Cretans, we have to get that word quite pronounced right, otherwise it doesn't sound very good. It's not Cretan. It's Cretan, people from Crete. He says that all Cretans are liars. That doesn't sound very good, does it? And then he says something funny. He says, they're all liars. That is true. He's kind of giving a little bit of a wordplay there. And the wordplay we may not fully catch it's actually, he's saying, it is in their genuine nature to be disingenuine. It is their genuine na nature to be fake, to be false, to put up a fake front, to make themselves look good when really they are not. A book I quoted a month ago by John Eldridge says this, we long to be praised. We dread exposure. What people think of me is a very powerful motivator. It is still shaping us more than we like to admit. Do any of us go through one entire day being utterly true, no matter how many different environments we move through? Do you even know the true you? Is there a true you? And he continues on saying this. Jesus is on a mission to rescue people who are so utterly deceived most of them do not even want to be rescued. His honesty and severity are measured out precisely according to the amount of delusion and self-deception in casing the listener. In other words, we mess up because we convince ourselves of one of two things. Either we're better than we really are. And therefore, I do not need a Savior. Or, we deceive ourselves into thinking, I am so bad, God is not powerful enough to work in my life. And that is not just true of the world out there, it is true within the church, very much so. That either we are so convinced that, and, and we go back and forth between these two, very much. Either that I'm, I'm good. I mean, look at me. I mean, that guy over there, he's pretty bad. I'm, I'm better than that guy. So I'm not so bad. Or, man, look at, I messed up again. 
God can't do anything with me, can he? Because I keep going to God and saying, God, can you help me get over this? And I keep messing up over and over again. So therefore, God must not be powerful enough. So therefore, I'm stuck where I am. We fall into one of those two lies very easily. Let's talk about that first one. Romans 1 is a passage that gets the church into a lot of trouble in this present day. Romans 1 is a passage in which he starts talking about the things that are wrong in this world, including within our lives, that he says that God gives us over to our sinful nature because we want to be there. And the rest of Romans 1 is a horror story of what that means. And he talks about humanity exchanging the divine for the mortal, chasing after lusts instead of God. And then he goes into the part that really gets us into trouble about even traded natural relations for homosexual relations. And it becomes a passage that, man, people get mad at us these days for that one. And he keeps going, talking about what a mess this world is in. And he goes through a list of sins that are bound in this world. And that's where Romans 1 ends, with a list of what's wrong. I'm going to tell you something. We can mess it up at this point. Chapter divisions in the Bible are not like chapters in a book. In a chapter in a book, generally, when you come to the end of a chapter and you go to a new chapter, you're going to a new subject, right? Well, the chapter divisions in the Bible were added like more than a thousand years after the Bible was written. They do not necessarily show us anything other than how to find something. They're not a break. And the problem is, we go through chapter one, and it's this great list of everything that is wrong in the world, then we stop. And then we pick it up later again in chapter 2. But actually, it's a continual flow. And I want to tell you how chapter 2 starts. He gives this list. Here's everything wrong in the world. Therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man. Every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing God's Kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. It's a long passage. It's basically saying this. Okay, you find something on that list of sins that's wrong and condemn somebody, you're really condemning yourself because you are in the same boat. And it's amazing as you go through the list of sins in Romans chapter 1, what they sound like. Murder's on that list. Now, does anybody have an objection that murder should be on that list? Probably not. Do you know what follows right after that? Gossips. What's gossip and murder in the same category? You might know, put slander in the same category. You <coughs> speak negatively about somebody else. He puts foolishness on that list. I gotta be honest with you, I might understand that one a little bit. Nobody else, I'm sure. But it's being boastful on that list. Now, I, I kind of understand some of those sins. And he's saying, you know what? You think you're better than anyone else? Look at this list. If you gossip, you're in the same category as a murderer. That kind of puts, in fact, if you condemn a murderer and you've gossiped, God's finger's pointing back at you saying, you need to come to repentance. 
You need to come here to this great God who is at work. I have never murdered, but the truth is there are a lot of things in that list that I have done, and at this very moment I am in desperate need of a Savior. I need him today. I am in desperate need of him. But there is a second error that truth confronts. That because I might fall into that category that I am not good enough for God, that I limit him by what I perceive are my failures. I was contemplating this week uh, as I was driving into the church and a song came on the radio that I was listening to called The Voice of Truth. And it caught my ear because I knew I was preaching on truth this week. And it, it, it went like this. It, it starts in the first verse talking about the Apostle Peter stepping out of a boat on a lake because Jesus is walking on water and he tries to do the same and he fails. He doesn't have enough faith. So he sinks. You know that song goes on when we realize that maybe we're not good enough? It says this. I'm going to play this song at the end. I'm not going to sing it. Don't worry. But the waves are calling out my name and they laugh at me, reminding me of all the times I've tried before and failed. The waves keep on telling me time and time again, boy, you will never win. You'll never win. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says, do not be afraid. The voice of truth says, this is for my glory. I love how this ends. Out of all the voices calling out to me, how many voices are out there that we listen to? In the back of our own head, to our neighbors, to other people, whoever. We hear a lot of voices that tell us we're bad, we're wrong, we messed up. Out of all the voices calling out to me, I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth. There are a lot of lies around us that say, you are not good enough. And the voice of truth is screaming out that that is a false way to look at the world. Because it's dishonest. In fact, both ways of looking at the world, either I'm good enough or I'm not good enough, are dishonest. In fact, they are completely irrelevant to your faith. We have nothing to do with the success of God in our lives, except to get out of the way. The voice of truth comes and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the mystery of godliness is knowing him. We've got to find that truth. When criticism comes, when stress is coming, we get distracted. We can so easily forget hope. We can forget about love. We can forget about the other things of Jesus. And in those moments, we need to deliberately look to Jesus. So we are true to what we believe. We need to deliberately come back to him. We are so easily distracted. That song I just quoted, it has a second verse. Second verse has to do with David and Goliath. And David hearing all the voices saying, you know, from people who are afraid saying, ah, you don't have a chance. Don't go fight Goliath. And that, the, the second verse that song goes like this. But the stone was just the right size to put the giant on the ground. And the waves don't seem so high from on top of them looking down. I will soar with the wings of eagles directly out from the prophet Isaiah, when I stop and listen to the sound, this is interesting because I'm quoting this, but this is something that I've talked about many times the last couple of months on Sunday mornings. When I stop and listen to the sound of Jesus singing over me. I've said this several times. Why do we sing to God? Because he's singing to us. It's a response. I will choose to listen and believe the word of truth. In a day where we admire cynicism and sarcasm and put-downs and we tend to hear them, 
We have a Savior who comes along that is very different. We find one full of hope and joy and optimism. Not in ourselves, but as we look at Jesus. Max Lucado, the author, uh, told a story that I read this week about the Wemex. It's a parable type story. So he's, he's taking a, a fall, um, fall story. fictional story. He writes a fictional story and there's supposed to be parallels that we can see the Christian life in. And these, these Wemex uh, led, or the, the hero of the story is one called Punchinello. The, the idea is they're wooden creatures who would be made and it's supposed to sound kind of like Pinocchio. Think of them like that. They're, they're like wooden puppet creatures. Again, parable, not true story. But this Punchinello would go through their lives, him and the rest of these Wemmicks would go through their lives, and uh, they were these wooden creatures. Some of them were a little bit beat up. <clears throat> Paint would chip. They didn't look so colorful anymore. Their colors would fade. And at the end of every day, for some reason, they all got a sticker. And they put the sticker right on their chest. Some people, some of them, they got these bright gold stars, shiny, and they put it on the chest. And some of them would get gray dots, and they put it on themselves. Punchinello would notice that sometimes ones like him, they got chipped a lot, that their colors were faded, they, they tended to get the gray dots. And those who look good, when the bright colors and their paints succeeded to stay on, they tended to get the, the stickers that were gold and stars. The stickers came because how you saw yourself and how others saw you. Well, one day, this Punchinello is going along and he meets uh, a young female wooden creature named Luca, or Lucha, I don't know how he means to pronounce it, who had no sticker. Walking around, no sticker on him. He did notice that she had a strange varnish that protected her color. And he asked her about it and said, why are you different? She said this, we are all made by a master craftsman. We are all meant to have this varnish, but we were taken away before he finished. And she takes Punchinella to meet the master creator, who paints a varnish on them that makes them so that stickers no longer stick to them. Those with the gold stars thought they were better than the rest. Those with the little gray dots thought they were worse. Do you know what? God comes along and says, you don't need a stick. You need me. What the world says about you, what you say about you, does not matter. What matters is this. Jesus came to save you. That's the truth of God. A truth that challenges you not to be the person you think you should be. Not to be the person who others think you are, but to get rid of the labels. And instead, find a Savior who created you to be like Him. He wants to bring you back to creation. And the only way that we can see through the lies is to know the one who is true. We're going to sing a closing hymn that leads us back to things of Jesus. It's hymn number 204, What a Friend, the other Jesus.